uh, if a person works on order, let's say a craftsman produces something on orders or under coercion, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is because he's a machine and we want people to be human. And you find exactly the same thing in Adam Smith, incidentally. Uh, one of the reasons, Adam Smith was very critical of division of labor. I mean, he has an ode to division of labor at the beginning of Wealth and Na of Nations, but if you go on, he criticizes it at the end. And he criticizes it because he says, if we let division of labor continue, we will reduce people to creatures as stupid and as ignorant as it's possible for a creature to be, because they'll simply be carrying out mechanical operations under command in a very limited domain. And what you are, you know, your intelligence, your understanding, your, your human characteristics come from your capacity, your, from the options available to you to carry out independent, productive, creative, activities, work included, uh, maybe in free association with others because we're social beings, but uh, not under external coercion. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he said any civilized society is going to have to prevent this from happening. Uh, in the 18th century, in the sort of, in the Enlightenment and the period of, you know, early modern libertarian revolutions, uh, people like, for example, Wilhelm von Humboldt and Rousseau uh, thought about the, exactly these questions. Uh, they were both, they both understood in some sense, it was hard to formulate it clearly and coherently at the time, but they both grasped the idea that languages are basically infinite, that they're expressions of human creativity. In fact, that's a leading Cartesian idea, which came to them right through the rationalist and romantic traditions. And they were also both interested, deeply interested, in uh, uh, human liberation. Uh, and they did, in fact, try to connect these things pretty much in the way you suggest, by uh, suggesting that it, at some core level, uh, part of human nature is a, uh, uh, it, which is reflected on the cognitive side in things like language, is the capacity to produce and understand and articulate and express new thoughts without limit uh, and without control. So the crucial fact about language use is that it's not determined by our situation. It's coming out of us as freely willed action in some sense and continually novel and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, and to express thoughts and ideas that are new to oneself and to other people but that are intelligible and appropriate and so on. This is a core aspect of human nature. In fact, for the Cartesians, it was the, the mark of mind. It was the point at which, the specific point at which minds differentiated from machines in their framework. At the core of human nature, again, is a kind of what was later called by Bakunin an instinct for freedom. That is a, uh, a need to become involved in uh, free creative activity, free creative work. So for, say, Humboldt, uh, one's work is sort of the core of one's existence. You want to be involved in creative, honest uh, work uh, in association with others, but voluntary association and not under external control. Uh, these things have mostly been forgotten. Uh, so the, as the market systems of the 19th century developed, they eliminated all of this. Uh, they would have appalled Adam Smith, no doubt you know, the, the market systems that developed because they, uh, it, when you get to people like, say, Malthus and uh, Ricardo and so on, the conception of human beings as freely creative, active people with intrinsic rights due to their nature disappears and people become nothing more, they have no values other than, a value other than what they can sell on the market, their labor power. If you can't sell your labor power on the market, you have no right to live. That's the way it was discussed. Uh, because there's nothing to a human being other than what can be attained by sale of labor power within a market system under what become basically totalitarian structures, corporate structures and so on. So the modern extensions of classical liberalism are very anti-libertarian uh, and these ide and the ideologies change and you know the intellectuals change and so on. So this tradition has pretty much been well, if not wiped out, at least marginalized. But it's there, and it certainly can be revived. It stayed alive, in, uh, for example, in the anarchist tradition and in parts of the libertarian left uh, 
in the United States, uh, you find traces of it as late as, real traces, as late as people like John Dewey, who probably didn't know any of these things, but just came out of it from another source and, you know, reached the same point in his conception of democracy as of value because it opens the opportunities for people to freely liberate themselves, as they must do. And it's their sort of core and essence. In the contemporary world, you'd be hard put to find much discussion of this, unfortunately. But I think it should be revived. I think it's very significant. Hmm. That's an interesting question, actually. I mean, Marx himself was a complex figure, the early Marx. So you read the philosophical manuscripts and so on. The, you know, this is coming straight out of the French, French and German Romanticism. So the kinds of ideas you find expressed in Humboldt and in the more libertarian side of Rousseau, Rousseau himself was very split. But if you take the libertarian s part of Rousseau, the second discourse on inequality and Humboldt and so on, all of this was, that's the background in which Marx grew up. And if you read the uh, philosophical and manuscripts of the early period, they're immersed in this. So his theory of alienation comes out of this. Uh, work, coerced labor is alienating and counter to human nature precisely for these reasons, for the Humboldtian reasons. Uh, when you get to the later Marx, you know, it's not, it's, I mean, it's sort of like a scholarly debate about whether he changed his mind or just started talking about other things. But uh, anyway, you don't find it any longer. And by that time, Marx, Marxism does become, exactly as you say, very detrimental to this. So you get this idea, which you, you do find in Marx, but he couldn't have believed it, that uh, human nature is just a historical product, and people are just malleable. They're made what their culture turns them into. You get this even in people like Gramsci, who was one of the more libertarian Marxists. But this idea that humans are simply formed by the environment, and they are nothing but clay, you know, passive clay in the hands of their molders. Uh, that's an idea which is very attractive to radical intellectuals because they think they're going to be the molders, of course, and that leads right to the Leninist version of Marxism. And it does become a kind of orthodoxy. Uh, and the earlier views of, are either forgotten or marginalized, although they're certainly there in Marx, and they certainly are in the tradition that he came from. And curious enough, would you say that the same kind of the notion of human nature is not very far from what the behaviorist and Skinner. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You know, I mean, the, I mean, the Marxists and the behaviorists are right in the same ballpark. The, these kinds of Marxists. Uh, and, and in fact, it's, I think, it's a tragedy and a catastrophe that the left uh, has been, has accepted the idea of humans as uh, historical products, simply reflections of their environment. Because what follows from that, of course, is that there's no moral barrier to molding them any way you like. I mean, if humans have no inner nature, if they don't have an inner instinct for freedom, you know, if it's not fundamental to their nature to have free, creative, productive work under their own control, if that's not part of their nature, then why, you know, there's no, advantage, there's no moral reason for allowing them that space. You could just mold them into being what you think they ought to be. And you can be the central committee, or you can be the, uh, you know, the, the managers of the corporation, or uh, the directors of a fascist state, or whatever. And it's quite interesting that the intellectual, the modern intellectuals, have mostly have moved in one or the other of those directions overwhelmingly. Either they're, uh, and in fact, this was for, foretold in one of the, maybe the only prediction of the social sciences that ever came so dramatically true, uh, was. Uh, Bakunin's discussion of this in the late in the late nineteenth century, he was sort of arguing with Marx, and it's well before Leninism, but he predicted uh, very perceptively that the rising class of intellectuals are just kind of becoming identified as a class in modern modern industrial societies. Uh, he predicted that they were essentially going to go in one of two directions. Uh, there would be some who would believe that. Uh, the struggles of the working class would offer them an opportunity to rise and take state power in their own hands. And at that point, he said, they would become the red bureaucracy who would create the worst tyranny that humanity has ever known. Of course, all in the interests of the workers. That's one direction. And he said the others uh, would recognize that you're never going to get power that way. 
And the way to get power is to associate yourself with what we would nowadays call state capitalism uh, and just become the servants of its ruling class. Uh, and then you become the managers and the ideologues uh, and so on for the state capitalist system. And as he put it, those people will beat the people with the people's stick. In other words, they'll talk about democracy, but they'll really be beating the people with the stick of democracy, which they'll turn into a mechanism of coercion. There's some who think you can get power by, by exploiting popular struggles, and there are others who see that you're going to get power by just associating yourself with the people who already have economic power and hence largely dominate. And I think that was a very accurate description of the century that followed him. Uh, on the one, this is 50 years before the Bolshevik Revolution, but he predicted its form very precisely and also its ideological background. And he also predicted quite accurately what happens in the modern state capitalist industrial societies. And looking at it now from the retrospect of 100 years, uh, we can see, I think we can see this development very clearly. And it also explains an odd fact about 20th century intellectual life, namely how easy it's been from, for people to shift from one position to another. So the same person who's a Stalinist apologist one year is a super American patriot, you know, the next year supporting every atrocity and uh, working and working in the Hoover Institute and, you know, associated with most reactionary institutions. That transition, which sometimes is called the God that failed change, which was sort of authentic in the early years, like people like Silone and others, you know, there was something authentic about it. It became a joke. I mean, as, as when people within the, in fact, we're seeing it in Russia right now, the, the worst commissars are now the ones who are most passionate about the, you know, the free market and investing and enriching yourself and so on. It, they've made the transition very easily, and that goes way back. And I think the reason is there's no transition. It's just a different estimate as to where power lies, but the same ideology. The ideology is you beat the people with the people's stick, and we're going to do it. And in fact, if you look at modern democratic theory in the West, it's remarkably similar to this. It's remarkably Leninist in its character. If you think of modern democrat, the leading tendencies in modern democratic theory in the West, so in, uh, in, in academic world, it would be uh, the strands of political science that develop from the thinking of people like Harold Laswell and others, one of the founders of modern contemporary political science. And in the general sphere, the Wilsonian intellectuals, the so-called progressive intellectuals, of whom maybe Walter Lippmann was the most uh, striking example in the United States, progressive intellectual in the 1920s, uh, if, uh, who do, all of these people develop theories of democracy, and they're quite interesting. They're very Leninist in their character. The conception is that in a democracy there's two classes of citizens. There's the general public, who Lippmann calls uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, and Laswell says they're too stupid to, we should not be overcome by dogmatisms uh, about the common man who's too stupid to be able to do anything. That's the standard view. So there's these people, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, which is maybe 90% of the population. And then there are the responsible men, the wise men, you know, the smart people, um, the uh, people with integrity and honor, the intellectual aristocracy, whatever you call them. And they have to rule. They're the ones who make the decisions, who do the thinking, uh, and so on. And the role of the masses, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, is just to show up every couple of years, uh, decide which of the smart guys is going to be their leader, and then go home. They have nothing more to do. That's a democracy. Uh, and then you have variation. There's the, the way Lippmann put it, the general public are to be spectators, not participants. Their only participation is... Uh, uh, lending their weight to one or another representative of the dominant class uh, and then going home. That's an election. And the spectrum extends from about there, that's the liberal side, over to the more reactionary side, uh, where you get people like, say, Reaganites, people who call themselves conservatives, though any authentic conservative would be appalled by their positions. They're really statist reactionaries. And their view, the Reaganites were very striking in this respect, their view is that the people shouldn't even be spectators. 
because it's none of their business what the state is doing. So in the period when the right wing takes over, say the Reagan years, uh, what they try to do is close off state power so you can't even see it. Uh, they, that's why they instituted unprecedented censorship. And it's why they carry out clandestine operations. Clandestine operations, which they loved, are not a secret from anybody except the population at home. So for example, say during the Greek Civil War in the late 1940s, it was no secret to the Greeks. They could see what was happening. But it was a secret here, because it was clandestine that the U.S. was involved in major atrocities, in fact. And it's the same right through the 80s. Uh, so the idea is we have to, the state has to be so powerful uh, and so private that the ignorant outsiders can't even see what's going on. Now, if you look at the modern world, this is happening in a very dramatic way. So one of the major things that's happening now is the transfer of real power away from parliamentary institutions and towards a transnational system of private power. Uh, transnational corporations and their own institutions, like the IMF and GATT and the World Trade Organization and the World Bank and the, the executive meetings of the G7, you know, big seven rich countries. That's a uh, system of decision making which is completely separate from public, from the public. The public has no idea what's going on. There's almost no way of figuring out what's happening in the GATT Council. I mean, I doubt if there's one American in a million who knows what was decided in the last, in the, in what's in the GATT Treaty. You can't, I mean, you have to be a specialist, you know, who goes, who knows how to go to specialized documents, even to get a picture of it. And a lot of it you can't even find because it really is secret. Well, that's the, and in fact, transnational corporations themselves are, you know, almost the, you know, the, the unimaginable attack on democracy would have absolutely appalled someone like Adam Smith or Thomas Jefferson uh, because they are totalitarian institutions completely absolutist, absolutely unaccountable, public has nothing to say about them. Uh, internally, they're completely hierarchic, they're kind of like the economic equivalent of super fascism. Uh, and uh, they ca they're also undermining free trade. It's called trade, but that's a joke. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, much of the world is moving in this direction. There's a major attack on democracy. The use of terror is the same. Uh, take, say, El Salvador, just had elections. Uh, uh, now, it, 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 it's quite interesting to see the background for those elections. In the 1970s, uh, there, was, there were the beginnings of the possibilities of democracy in Central America. There were, organi there were popular organizations developing, a lot of them coming out of the church, you know, peasant organizations, Bible study groups that became self-help groups, unions, and so on. All right, that's the basis for popular participation in controlling your own life. What did it lead to? Well, it led to a decade of incredible terror. Torture, massacres, uh, mutilation, uh, starvation, economic strangulation, just a violent reaction in which people were traumatized. Uh, and now they're allowed to have elections, as they just did, because, it is, because it's been driven into their heads that if they get out of line, they're going to get in real trouble. Now here, people pretend at least not to see it, but in El Salvador they see it. Like the Jesuits in El Salvador uh, just had a conference uh, before the election in which they pointed out quite, uh, in reviewing the situation of Central America, which is just devastated, uh, they said that uh, there's two aspects of terror that you have to think about. One is the narrow aspect. That's the low level of terror that always continues, like an occasional political assassination and so on which is just there to make people understand, don't forget, we're here. You know, we may not be doing a lot, but we're here. That's the narrow kind of terror. Then they say this is the deeper kind of terror, the kind that's taken place for a long period and it domesticates people. It gets them to internalize the understanding that, they, that there are very narrow limits to what they can do. And if they try to go beyond those limits, they're going to be in very serious trouble. Their children will be murdered, and their wives will be raped, and they'll be killed, and so on. Once that becomes part of people's psyches, uh, and they're domesticated, as they put it, then you can have the powerful can run free elections with no concern at all, uh, because people have understood that there are no options. 
and that's what's happening in much of the much of the world, not in the third world. In the richer countries, other things are happening which have parallel aspects, and it's all a major attack on the libertarian tradition, which we can trace to the 18th century. The range of even articulate discussion is narrowing uh, as control becomes more and more centralized. A privatization increases this because it puts power in the hands of absolutely unaccountable corporate structures. Pure, I mean, you know, public television, let's say, can be a, as democratic as the society is. Most societies, I mean, it's not very democratic, but at least there's a some the some relation to the public in public radio and television. Private radio and television is zero. You have as much relation to it as you have to General Motors. It does what it wants, and it's an, it's granted the right to do that. Uh, and the more business-run societies have moved in this direction faster. Like take the United States, which is a very free country in the sense that the government can't coerce people to the extent that they can elsewhere. On the other hand, it's a business-run society, kind of a one-class society. You know, this violent class war going on, but completely one-sided, very self-conscious business community and nothing much else. Uh, when television came along, there wasn't even a discussion. It just became totally privatized, uh, this so-called public television, which came much later, but it's very marginal, and even that's largely private. Uh, and uh, with this new, the, the new, what they call information highway, you know, this new technology of interactive uh, computers and video and so on. I mean, there is an argument going on now, but we all know how it's going to turn out. Private power is so overwhelming as compared with public organization that it will be privatized and it will be nothing more than another technique of coercion, uh, of, of selling people things they don't want, of controlling them and so on. It's kind of interesting to look at the debate that's going on right now over this. This is a major issue right now, there's all this new technology. And it's the next step after radio and television now we're in this. And if you look at the debate, it's very enlightening. Uh, they're talking about how democratizing it is and how wonderful it's going to be. And then when you look at the examples, it turns out the examples are given are primarily home marketing, meaning you can sit in front of your television set and you'll see things for sale and you know nice young women advertising it. And then you can just push a couple of buttons and somebody will mail it to your house. That's called interactive. That's real participation in controlling your life. Then the other thing, the only other thing I've seen mentioned is that uh, in football games, you know, like Super Bowl and so on, where everybody's supposed to be glued to them and watching them, because you're not supposed to think about any important thing that might matter. You have to be a passive spectator. So everybody in the country, or at least all the men, are watching the Super Bowl. And since this is now an interactive system, they're going to they're going to try to set up something in which they're going to be able to punch in the play that they think the quarterback ought to call next. You know, so here you are and they're all standing there and the quarterback's going to make a decision and you're allowed to punch in what you think he ought to do. Of course, he doesn't hear you. You don't have any influence. Even on that, you don't have any influence. It's just that you're allowed to express your opinion. And then, you know, after the quarterback does something, the commentator will say, well, here's what 90% of the people thought or something. Well, that's the kind of interaction that they want. They want to, they want to make, make people feel that that's interaction, that's participation. And this is very revealing. I mean, the idea, or, or maybe you can express your opinion. If somebody will ask a question, you know, do you want health care? And you'll be able to push a button and say, yeah, I want it. But nothing that involves actual participation in making decisions or forming plans or uh, organizing with people. These are very atomizing technologies. You're alone. You don't talk to anybody. Uh, and uh, at most, you can individually express your view uh, to uh, unaccountable power, corporate and state power. And that's what's considered democracy. Uh, so the, uh, the, the monopolization of the, uh, the print media is simply another aspect of it. Same with publishing. Publishing is becoming very much narrowed uh, in all sorts of ways, in part just through market pressures. So for example, if you travel around the United States now and take a look at a city, you barely find a bookstore. I mean, it used to be there were bookstores all over. Take, say, Cambridge, where we are, you know, university towns. There were bookstores all over the place. Not much anymore. There's still a few around the colleges. Actually, around MIT, there's nothing. But around Harvard, the other big university, there's a few. But not much, nothing like what it was 20 or 30 or, say, 
when I came here in the 1940s. It was totally different. There's a bookstore in every corner. Uh, now you have a few big chains who can sell, they'll sell mostly bestsellers because they, they want mass production. So they'll sell things cheap, you know, and uh, virtually nothing else. It's not worth it to them economically to have books around that only a few people will be interested in. It doesn't pay, like having a brand of shoes that only a few people want to buy. Uh, so what you do is, uh, you the, the chains, which are all over the country, they of course can undercut the, 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 the bookstores that have some, you know, the deal, the, the, that have intellectual interests or some focus or whatever, because they can sell the, you know, they can sell the best sellers much cheaper. So they'll undercut everyone else, just like, you know, just like supermarkets. Uh, and uh, they themselves are only interested in mass-produced items. And that's having a big effect on literary production. For example, to write a first novel now is extremely hard. You don't have any more bookstores which are willing to sell a small number of copies of a first novel and get people known and so on. What the bookstores want is something that will sell a million copies. Uh, and if a book, if it's clear within a couple of weeks that a book isn't going to sell a million copies, it might as well be pulped, you know, cut it up and make scrap paper out of it. Uh, you, you look at a, take, take a look at, next time you're at an airport at the newsstand, all there is is very cheap bestsellers. Uh, and this is true in much of Europe, too, I've noticed. Uh, the, the, the magazines, the newspapers, the books, and so on, are the level is declining, in part simply through market pressures. Uh, uh, and that has a very narrowing effect on thought in general. It, it, it gets people to... It, it's like this domestication through terror. It narrows horizons. Uh, and it, it's functional in that respect. It drives the population to being at most spectators and probably not even spectators, just out of the system altogether as power gets removed even more remotely from accountable institutions like parliaments. And uh, that's very much the tendency in the modern world. In fact, it's probably accelerating. Same as always. I mean, it begins with un trying to understand what's happening and helping others to understand Understanding is a collective activity. People don't do it alone. You do it in groups, whether it's the sciences or political life. You work together with people. That's how you clarify your ideas and you learn things and so on. So the beginning is understanding. The next thing is organization. The next is all kinds of action. I mean, the power is in the, is potent, has always been recognized, even by the most reactionary people, that the general population have the power. In fact, you go back to, say, David Hume, very conservative. His, his uh, principles of government begin by what he, kind of like a paradox. How come that the many are willing to be governed by the few? They don't have to be. They could take power themselves. And he says even in the most autocratic system, the general population always has the power to take over if they want. So how come they submit themselves? His answer is, well, what we would call propaganda, control of opinion. It says the rulers have to control opinion. And unless they control opinion, people will rise up and take things over for themselves. And there's a lot of truth to that. I think he sort of underestimated the use of violence, but uh, there's a lot of truth to that. And in our societies, the more free societies, it really is opinion more than force that's controlling people. And we have to break out of that. We have to break out of the ideological strictures that prevent people from seeing things. And then there are many opportunities for organizing an action, and they've been pretty successful. So I've been talking about the ugly side of things, but there's another side, which is quite contrary. Uh, here I can talk best about the United States, but I think it's worldwide. Uh, in the United States, in the last 30 years, uh, there has been a tremendous cultural change. The culture is much more free and open and libertarian than it was 30 years ago in many respects. Uh, so uh, major issues that didn't even exist 30 years ago are now common coin. Um, issues of, say, uh, women's rights or uh, civil rights for my respect for other cultures, let's say, environmental issues, uh, solidarity with the poor with third world countries. All of these are at levels way beyond what they ever were. And that's another aspect of the civilizing effect of the popular movements. And this has had major impact on policy and everything else. Uh, it hasn't yet reached to the central institutions of power, 
but there are more and more people concerned about it. Uh, and even in the last months, this has changed. So, for example, for the first time in its modern history, the American labor movement is now recognizing that it must uh, be committed to international solidarity. First time. American labor unions are now supporting Mexican workers. Never happened before. In fact, American labor unions were helping create the conditions of repression for workers in the third world. It's finally gotten home to them that they can't do this. If they do this, they're going to simply destroy themselves. And besides, it's inhuman, beginning to understand what they're in fact doing. And, you know, people are not gangsters. If they see what's going on, they're not going to like it. Uh, and uh, you have the first signs of uh, things like, say, uh, protecting American, uh, Mexican workers or uh, Haitian workers and others who are trying to organize and survive under repressive and brutal societies, in fact, societies in which American corporations are dominant. Well, that's something really quite new. Now, you know, it's too small a scale to affect the centralization of power in Brussels and Geneva and the, in Zurich and New York, you know. But it's a beginning, and it's a major change over past years, and it just has to expand. If it doesn't, we're in bad trouble. As the economy is becoming more globalized, the third world model is becoming globalized. I mean, there's a third world model. You go to any third world country, there's a small sector, you know, 10% maybe of great wealth and privilege, often super wealth and privilege. Then there's, you know, huge mass of population who are basically superfluous. And they live in misery and starvation, and uh, they're controlled by terror one or another way. And that's spreading to the, f to the first world. If you walk around New York or Boston, you see it. Uh, England and the United States are in the lead in this. That's Thatcher and Reagan, basically. But continental Europe's not that far behind. And as the economy becomes globalized, it's forced. So uh, it's getting to the point now where German corporations are shifting production to the United States because they can get cheaper and more oppressed labor in the United States, the richest country in the world. Uh, U.S. wages are now 60% lower than Germany and even 20% lower than Italy. Uh, that's the effect of this. Well, that's what happens in these uh, uh, business-run societies. England's kind of like it. But all of these are weapons against West European workers. Uh, the same is true at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the end of the Cold War basically drives Eastern Europe back to what it traditionally was, third world. In fact, in my opinion, that's what the Cold War was about. It was to try to stop this attempt at independence in one part of the third world, which never is acceptable. Uh, the Greek Civil War so back, was very similar back in the 40s when you look back at it. Uh, the, and the same with the fascist period. Uh, you want to make sure that third world people, in fact, Greece was regarded as third world at the time, do not move towards independence. They become assimilated and subordinated to the, you know, to, center, to the power of the wealthy. Uh, Eastern Europe went that way. It's, Eastern Europe is not Grenada. You can't get rid of it in a weekend. So it took 70 years. Uh, but they're now back in the third world for the most part. Not entirely, but you know, much of it is back in the third world. They're providing, the stru structurally, they're third world. They're providing resources and cheap labor and investment opportunities and markets. Like everywhere in the third world, there's a wealthy sector. To a large extent, the old Communist Party, who have just recognized the better off they shift in the other direction, but they're still in power. Uh, and uh, this is a weapon against Western European workers. Uh, Daimler-Benz and Volkswagen and uh, uh, General Motors say can shift production to uh, west to Eastern Europe, where they can get workers at a fraction of the cost of Western workers with no benefits and protect. They insist on protectionism because these people don't believe in the free market. So uh, when they move to Eastern Europe, they insist on tariff protection, high tariff protection, and other sorts of state intervention for their benefit, but they can use this as a weapon against their own working class. It's very self-conscious. If you read the business press, it's open. The Financial Times of London, you know, Business Week and so on, they talk about how wonderful this is because now you can undercut the luxurious lifestyle of the pampered Western European workers. You know, here there were all these people who thought they had a right to a job, let's say. Uh, or they had a right to a week's vacation or something. Well, that's pamp. This is, pe people have to understand that they don't have those rights. 
and we have to eliminate those rights and turn them into tools of production back to the 1820s, you know, who sell their power on the market and there's no further right to life. Uh, so this is having a polarizing effect throughout the world. The tra every trade agreement is like that. NAFTA, GATT, its, a t it's intention and its result will be to polarize, leading to exactly what you describe, and a basically third world model. So that's happening. That's happening. The centralization of power and the attack on democracy is happening. But the ferment among the general populations is also happening. They're all happening at the same time, and the question is which of these forces will be more significant. Uh, the drug war is being used primarily for that purpose. Uh, the primary reason for criminalizing drugs is so that you can have a weapon over poor people. Because you can move in, you know, any, like a fascist state will always set up a system of laws so oppressive that you're always violating the law. And then if they want you, they can get you. That's an efficient totalitarian state. And we, you know, this isn't fascist, it's not totalitarian, but they're moving in the same direction. So I think about a quarter of the prison population is people who are picked up with a, you know, a joint of marijuana in their pocket. They're not doing anything, you know. Uh, and that's, that's a way of controlling people, uh, plus the fact that the criminalization of drugs stimulates criminal gangs, which themselves control people. It's a good technique of control is to have criminal gangs running through the ghettos. That scares everybody and controls them. Uh, all of these are techniques of control, on, r reminiscent of what goes on in the third world. Like in El Salvador, they send out death squads. Here you do it a little differently. But the structural consequences are quite similar. And it's very reminiscent of early industrial revolution, and I think it's going to lead in the same directions towards popular organization and uh, either some accommodation or maybe a real change in the structure of power. But I think these are unpredictable. You can see the tendencies, but you don't know how they're going to balance.